became this thing of like looking at like my performances and how I am and it was like what does that represent and it was like fire and I was like um lilo so it was like this kind of train effect that kind of happened and the minute I kind of said it out of my mouth it was like oh this is it you know this is my name I wouldn't say I necessarily perform different characters. I think I perform different ideations of me. And in the beginning, I did actually use a physical white mask when I was seen as your anarchist. And I think part of that was the nature of what I was saying was kind of my views, but in a very um, intense, political, punky kind of way. In a way, that was a mask that was intentional. That was like, you know, I am using this mask to really say what I want to say. And once I became Umlilo, there was no need for that. I felt like I can show the different, I guess, the best way to describe them are different like facets of me coming out. in front of that mirror with all this makeup, what happens within you? I think it's like a process of meditation in a way. It's almost like you taking the time to really kind of be within yourself and as you transform, usually before a show or anything like that, it just helps get into the, the mode of like, how do I want to perform? And as I'm doing it, I'm deciding what what the type of look I'm going for. So I always improvise with everything. Gender for me is very much a spectrum. And it depends on the mood and how I feel on a particular day. I don't perform it for myself. It comes so naturally. I just go with whatever I'm feeling. So even with makeup, I don't feel that makeup is something that necessarily is a transformative thing from male to female. I feel like I can use makeup to even enhance maybe my masculine features. I can use makeup to enhance my feminine features. And I feel I'm one of those people that if you look at me, you won't be able to tell what gender I am. I don't like any affiliation with most genders, which is why I identify as non-binary, which basically means um, I don't belong to either category or I could gravitate towards either category and it's just up to me of what comes naturally. My grandfather was very traditional in a way, but I wouldn't call my family necessarily a traditional family. It was very mat matriarchal structure, so my grandmother to this day is like the center point um, of my family. We all kind of gravitate around her and towards her, so I think she was kind of the main person in the family, and my grandfather kind of played his part, but he was very laid back and chilled and let my grandmother do her thing. So I wouldn't say my family in the kind of traditional African sense um, of a man being at the top and everybody else kind of following. My family was very much, um, we didn't have those kind of hierarchies. My grand was very much like the person who, you know, put with the glue of the family. I think that environment really did inspire me. You know, when I look at my my mom, my aunts, my grandmother. I was surrounded by so many strong women that I think I always 
from a very young age, always saw women as figures of strength, um, decisiveness, um, fearlessness. And that was generally the energy um, of the women in my family. You know, everyone was very strong. Everyone really was a go-getter and they really held the family together. From a very young age, I gravitated towards more feminine things than traditionally masculine boy things. You know, um, I remember my mom and I used to always get into a full fight before preschool. Um, on every Friday, we'd be allowed to wear our kind of home clothes instead of a uniform. And we would always be in disagreement of what I should wear because I definitely had like a strong sense of myself from a young age, you know, from as far as I can remember, I knew myself to be who I am. Well, what does the gender mean to you? Does it mean to you anything? I think the way I see gender now is very different from how I saw it growing up or even when I was a teenager or, you know, in my early 20s in university. Um, gender for me now is really something that I don't try and concern myself too much about because I've come to a place where my evolution has gone from this kind of gender dysphoria that I had growing up as a kid, being so different from other kids, to this acceptance as a teenager and coming out to my family as um, gay and queer. And then in my varsity life, I kind of realized that I, actually I was a very queer person. And I did go through a period where I thought maybe I could be trans and I could be transgender. And because I got to really express my gender on the outward, you know, it led me to realize that actually um, the way I am itself is something that is unique and something that is a gift, you know. So it took me a long time to really accept both my feminine and my masculine side. I always thought that I had to make a choice. Five is a male. Yeah, five to nine is male. It is very important because then it means, you know, previously uh, or even current, when the ID number uh, encodes your gender, so it means if you were born female, you have an ID number that says female. Then if you transition or if you are intersex, then it means at a later stage you need to apply for a new ID. And that application, it's, 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 uh, it's, it has been a struggle. Apply gender to people anymore that people can define themselves what they want to be. How important is that yeah. for, for your organization? That, that, that is important because that is in line with the guidelines of the uh, World Health Organization that we do not need doctors to, to declare uh, people's genders. People need to identify themselves and say, uh, this is who I am. Because if it is uh, left in the hands of doctors, then it gives doctors um, um, too much power sits in their hand. Then they become like gatekeepers and they can decide uh, on people's genders. And that is problematic.
I think the gender neutral ID is something that could really be a revolutionary act in terms of South Africa's evolution, in terms of LGBT rights, especially trans and non-binary um, people's rights. You know, transgender people and non-binary people in this country are protected in terms of the constitution and the law. But when you look at it in practice is where you see the real issues, is that if I am you know, traveling, for example, I have to use my ID and I look like this, there's always this confusion of like, are you the same person that we're seeing on the picture? And, you know, those, those identifiers can be really hurtful for the LGBT community where every single time you're outed um, with your gender, which I don't think, you know, people that are cisgendered or that identify with the gender that they were born with um, have to go through. So that's a huge point of pain, especially for me, like in my life and other people in our, in our community, you know, when we use public spaces like public bathrooms or when we have to present our IDs, it's almost like you have to go through that same thing of like coming out again and be like, yes, I don't fit into this mold and then there's questions. So I feel like doing that and just cancelling the idea of even gender on your ID could not only be freeing for us as the LGBT IAQ community, but for the country at large. I love the South African constitution, you know, I think having been, you know, born and having seen this country evolve and was kind of at a very young age when, you know, the constitution came about, it's something that we uphold, that we respect so much, um, especially people in my generation or like my family and my friends and like, you know, it means so much. But I feel like, you know, 25 years down the line, we can see that that aspiration in practice needs more work, you know? So an example is with um, same-sex marriages in South Africa, it's this great ideal, and we were one of the first countries to kind of, you know, do it. But in practice, people at home affairs or people that are supposed to be officiating and administering this um, law had a choice of whether they wanted to or not. So you could say, I am a Christian person, I am not going to um, sign this document that is required by law. So we had to then have a law that forces people, regardless of your religious background, to actually not, not have a choice of whether you can serve LGBT people or not. So I think that's where our problem is in South Africa, is that we've got this ideal and we've got this aspirational constitution, but we didn't think further than that of how do we actually make it practical on the ground, you know? So that includes educating your, your, your government officers that, are, have, that have to work in these areas and educating them about prejudice and educating them about distancing themselves from the work that they do. Because whether you're religious or you believe in this has got nothing to do with your job. You don't see an accountant going, no, I'm not gonna um, do your accounting books because you know, you're a queer person or this. So I don't think it should apply in government offices. Instead, that should be the place where it's a really safe space for anybody, regardless of your race, your gender, your background, um, your sexuality. Government offices are there to serve the public and they're there to serve people. But aren't you always a little bit on edge? Always, you know. I'm always on edge because I'm like, I, feel, I see myself as somebody who lives on the outskirts of society. I've always seen myself as a rebel, an outsider. I've always seen myself as something, somebody who's not traditional, who doesn't follow the traditional modes of things, and I know what comes with that, you know. 
what comes with that is that you will stand alone, you will stand out, and you will be looked at in a certain kind of way. And you just have to build that strength within yourself and still be safe. Because in South Africa, you know, I could be confident in walking and be myself, but that does put a level of danger on my life. You know, I could get harassed, I could get killed, I could get raped. There are so many variables of how that plays out in public, you know, because people feel so much authority over people's bodies, um, especially femme bodies, especially trans bodies, especially, you know, women. It, it's, it's, it's a huge struggle that we have in this country that when you are a femme person, regardless of how you perform that, if you're a feminine person in this country, the minute you leave your house, you're in danger. I'm very proud that South Africa is setting a good example for the rest of the African continent and maybe even the global south. But at the same time, South Africa is a country of contradictions that, for instance, right now in our constitution, we are so outright about protecting people on the basis of their sexual orientation. But as I'm speaking to you now, this month alone, people have been killed. So we have high murders, much as we have good law. It's unbelievable that at the moment, last night, two cases came in. And these are, these, these are not isolated cases. I can say to you, in the space of uh, two months, April and May, I'm sure we have uh, around 10 or 12 people that have been killed in South Africa. It is completely crazy. We met with the Minister of Justice because we are demanding that they process the hate crimes bill because it's been sitting with Parliament since 2018. I think I perform different ideations of me, you know? So I think I've always been a very versatile chameleon-like figure and I don't take that for granted, you know? I can really do so many different looks and really pull them off and not everybody can do that. I actually use a physical white mask when I was seen as your anarchist and I think part of that was the nature of what I was saying was kind of my views but in a very... Um, intense, political, punky kind of way. So in a way, that was a mask that was intentional, that was like, you know, I am using this mask to really say what I want to say. 
And once I became Umlilo, there was no need for that. Everything became a lot more kind of personal and political, but I felt like I could now really show who I am and I can show the different, I guess the best way to describe them are different like facets of me coming out. Body also comes a great sense of loss. I know for millions from a long time that you've lost someone very personal to you. Mm. I mean, I'm out. Yeah. the fire? Did it sometimes suppress the fire? Did it uh, put you in positions where you want to give up? Does it push you to go forward? How does that affect you? Um, I think nothing is worse for a child, any child, any age, than losing a parent, you know? And um, I definitely struggled with losing my mom. I lost my dad at four. So I was really grateful that I've had my mom all my life. And, you know, she was kind of one of my best friends, my main fan, my supporter, you know, and that, that was also really difficult of losing that close relationship. I don't think I've ever felt an unconditional love that I felt with my mother. You know, I knew that no matter who I am, what I did, she just loved me unconditionally. And that is a huge loss because it's something that you can't replace. Um, and I think for me, it really allowed me, at the time when my mom was like really sick, I've lost a lot of people in my family without a sh within a short space of time. You know, so that already was very difficult, but it, a lot of decisions that I've made in my career have been around my family. I decided <clears throat> to move back to Joburg to be closer to my family, to be closer to my mom. And now I think about it, I'm like, wow, you know, that decision was so good because I then got to spend more time because you never know how long you're going to be with anyone. Um, so in the year that my mom was like really sick and we were all taking turns of taking care of her, I still had so much going for me. I still had to travel. I still had to do all of these things. And now when I look back, I'm actually really shocked that I was still alive. I was very hurt. I was in pain. I was, I was almost on autopilot. You know, I'd be flying to a city and I'm just completely numb. And now when I think about it, I, I'm literally surprised at how resilient the human spirit is because at that time, I don't know how I was even surviving or how any of us in my family were even surviving. And now that life, it's been two years and life has kind of settled down a little bit, I can reflect and, and say it was probably the most difficult period of my life, something that I will probably never get over. And it is something that has given me strength because my worst fear has already happened. So I feel like the world can't do anything to me at the moment. So I'm kind of like in my fear for goal phase where it's just like, I really, nothing worse can happen except for that, you know? So I feel like that's the positive for it is that once you've faced your biggest fear, you realize that like, actually you can get through anything. <laughs> So you fresh up a hospital with a bad lung thug like bad ass to victim the pin could be eating bad clothes hard green eating well I can tell what with the double chin get in line find out what set I'm in instead of getting fresh trying to hard to box me in in the back of a club that you can't even pronounce mean the next day you be fucked with that mouth call your loan shots so they take your big spouse tell your other friends why they can stick around sell your other car for a quarter of time while the banks pull you up trying to hard to get you down Shake you on your own Shake you on your own Cop those long shot niggas on your fancy mobile phone Shake you on your own Shake you on your own Cop those long shot niggas on your fancy mobile phone